Dear ladies and gentlemen, Pani Topanova, this is already 10th episode in the series of conversation and interviews with intellectuals in Ukraine for those out there who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. В етері уже 10-й випуск із серії розмов та інтерв'ю з інтелектуалами з України для тих, хто хоче дізнатися більше, думати глибше, слухати з першого джерела. This is a project of Pan Ukraine whose entire team is in Ukraine right now, besieged by the terror and violence of the continuing inv- invasion of the Russian army. And I will repeat again and again how much we all admire your dedication to spread the truth and uphold the freedom of expression. Це проєкт Пан Україна, вся команда якого зараз перебуває в Україні в облозі терору та насилля тривающего вторгнення російської армії. І я повторюватиму знову і знову, наскільки ми всі захоплюємося вашою відданістю поширенню правди і захистом свободи вираження поглядів. The project is co-hosted by Pan International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. We work under Pan International Charter. This event is organized with kind support of Pan Canada, and our partners for today are Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University, Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harman Institute at Columbia University. We are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages. Співорганізатором проєкту є міжнародний пан який продовжує надавати платформу для свободи вираження поглядів для тих, хто зараз перебуває у групі найвищого ризику. Ми дотримуємося хартії міжнародного ПЕН. Захід організовано за підтримки ПЕН Канада. Сьогоднішні наші партнери – ПЕН Америка, Український інститут, Український інститут Лондона, Ukraine World, Український науково-дослідний інститут Гарвардського університету та Інститут Гаррімана при Колумбійському університеті. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на всі партнерські сторінки у Facebook. Захід відбуватиметься англійською мовою. And I will introduce our speakers for today, who will focus on some long-term consequences which are not so often discussed those days. This is going to be discussion on really complicated issues as war propaganda and how to deal with it, the war and personal boundaries, how to stay rational, avoiding strong emotions, especially when you are involved straight away. And for sure, in this company, we can't avoid the feministic angle, women, women at war. Today's guests are Natalka Snyadanko, Ukrainian writer, journalist and translator, Joseph Conrad Literary Award winner, and the author of such books as The Passion Collection, Syndrome of Sterility, Frau Müller Does Not Wish to Pay More, Archduke Wilhelm Ordinary Exercise Book, The First Investigation of the Empress, and others. In one of your essays, Natalka, you call literature the last bastion, and it would be great to hear about your perspective of literature in this ongoing situation. And Natalka will hold her dialogue with Margaret Atwood. I'm not even sure if I should introduce you. (laughs) Canadian poet, novelist, literary critic, essayist, teacher, environmental activist, and inventor, a legend, basically. (laughs) Also well known for her feministic perspective. Margaret Atwood's work encompasses a variety of themes, including gender and identity, religious and myth, the power of language, climate change, and power politics, all what we are talking about here. Natalka, Margaret, stage is yours. Thank you. And thank you, and I'm, I'm happy to be here. Um, so who should begin? That's my question too. <laughs> that would be great if Natalka just say us a couple of updates, what is going on, and then you will proceed with the conversation. Mm-hmm. So, um, first of all, I have to thank you, uh, Margaret, for doing it. Uh, I know it is absolutely not obvious uh, to support anybody and to support Ukraine in this situation. And I know many people abroad who would not do uh, this this way. So I really appreciate you and I have to thank you for this. And uh, yeah, I I would like uh, to start with you. You are uh, are alphabetically. (laughs) for me and uh, would you like to ask me something or would you like to share something with us or me uh, 
Exactly. So let, let's, let's talk about why we are all involved in Penn. Um, so we began uh, Penn Canada in the 1980s, having concentrated in two earlier decades on creating a Canadian publishing uh, possibilities, because when I, I began, there weren't that many. And um, building up uh, associations of writers, because none of us knew um, in the 60s or early 70s what should be in a contract, how this was supposed to work. So we, we did that in, in those decades, the 60s and the 70s. And in the 80s, we organized uh, Penn Canada, which, as you know, Penn is dedicated to uh, helping writers in trouble. The Penn in Prison um, program, uh, Writers in Prison program, is for helping writers in other countries who have gotten into political difficulties with their regimes. And in the um, 90s, we thought maybe there were going to be fewer of these autocratic, dictatorial kinds of regimes. We had had a lot of them in the 20th century, and we're not just limiting to the big three, uh, but we're including, for instance, Pinochet in Chile and Pol Pot and the Argentinian generals, and we had a number of them, and we thought maybe they were diminishing. Uh, but then along came the 21st century, and things changed. And you are living through the results of those changes right now. And there is even more need for uh, an organization like Penn, because one of the first groups that are targeted when totalitarianisms take over are independent writers and uh, intellectual thinkers who do not uh, agree to become part of a totalitarian propaganda machine. So somebody my age, <laughs> since I was born in 1939, an important year in world history, um, this seems quite familiar to people of my age. We feel we have been here before. We feel that we have been alive when uh, some countries invaded other countries uh, in this rapid uh, way and without uh, any real reason. And it, it just seems very familiar to me. Uh, whereas I think young, very young people feel very shocked. They, they think that they have never witnessed anything like this. Um, so that is, that is where I stand in relation to time. And, um, and it's, it's also true that right now, a lot of people don't quite understand what, what freedom of expression originally meant. So it originally meant not that you could say anything you liked or publish anything you liked, but that you should not be put in prison or shot uh, for expressing uh, and publishing material that um, an autocratic regime didn't like. <laughs> That's what it originally meant. Uh, so I think we need to um, emphasize that uh, writers in Ukraine are particularly at risk, uh, okay, because they would be targeted. We know this has happened before when such regimes take over. And um, in Canada, we have people who escaped from Hungary, we have people who escaped from Argentina, we had people who escaped from Chile under Pinochet. And of course, we had a lot of people after World War II that were escaping. Um, some of them escaped, for instance, in Poland, they escaped two kinds of invasion. Um, both, both kinds would have killed them. Um, so so I, I grew up with these people in my life in the late 1940s and in the 50s. So we're, we're familiar with the problems of um, being targeted by regimes like that and needing to be and needing to get out and needing to be supported. 
So the, the fact that we are doing this with PIN International, with Ukrainian PIN, and with all of these partners that you have, means that a lot of people realize what the situation is. And uh, that's, that's quite positive. I mean, if anything's positive, that anyway, <laughs> that's a positive. <laughs> So the first thing I wanted to talk with you about is a little bit controversial. Uh, I, uh, I'm not in the country now, I'm not in Ukraine, and I'm abroad. It was an uh, accident, uh, not, uh, I, I didn't flee, I, I was just here. Um, the, war, the war began, and now I'm lucky the children are with me. And... Uh, I'm often asked uh, to attend uh, some events for Ukraine. And many um, people who organize uh, such events, especially here in Germany, they um, take it for normal uh, that they should uh, uh, invite writers from Ukraine, writers from Russia, writers from Belarus right now, and we should all sit together on the podium and uh, discuss uh, some literary things. I uh, refuse those invitations, I decline them, and uh, they're really not understanding why. Uh, and uh, I would like to you share your opinion about this thing, because it is really uh, not uh, clear for me why we all agree to isolate Russia, to boycott Russia in everything connected to um, economics, uh, to politics, to even sports. But uh, as far as we come to the culture, as far as we come to the propaganda, to people who did or was involved uh, into creating a propaganda, we suddenly say, of course, uh, culture is not political. <laughs> I find it not right at this moment. And many people um, find it not right in Ukraine. But if we are speaking about people abroad, it is not so clearly. Uh, can you comment on this? Well, I think this is a story we have lived before uh, because <laughs> When the uh, Iron Curtain was still up, there would be these uh, literary events and writers from East Germany and writers from West Germany would both be there. And they would dominate the entire conversation because the West German ones would attack the East German ones for not speaking up more about the wall. And the East German ones would say, you don't understand what it's like and you're not even there and so why are you even talking about it um, but but what i think everybody has to understand is that a writer who comes from such a regime and intends to go back cannot speak freely okay so if you are a russian writer and you're going abroad uh, and speaking at a, an event like that, everything that you say is going to be re recorded and reported back. Um, so you, you can't actually say what you might think. Um, and you are not having an, an open and, and free discussion about anything because it, it's too dangerous. Uh, and you might well say, well, if you were that uh, worried and if you're not just an agent of a uh, propaganda agent of the government, why don't you leave? <laughs> why don't you leave? Well, you know a lot of reasons why people might not leave. Their families are there. And we can remember also events that would take place in Finland, which was the one country where people actually from Russia were permitted to go. Um, there would always be two of them. One of them would be the writer and the other would be the secret police minder. <laughs> and again, you knew that you were not having an, an open and uh, free conversation because it was too dangerous. So, so that is the reality of, of those situations and, and cultural people speaking at such events cannot help but be uh, either avoiding the main topic, which right now is the invasion of Ukraine, um, or 
um, speaking on behalf of the government of which they um, from, from their country. And that is the reality. So uh, that is probably the thing that a lot of people in, in uh, countries unfamiliar with such situations don't know. I, I lived in West Berlin in 1984. What a strange year <laughs> to live there. The wall was still up, okay? It didn't look as if it was going to disappear soon, but as Canadians, we could travel to East Germany, we could travel to Czechoslovakia, we could travel to Poland. But, and we did that at the invitation of the Canadian embassies there. Um, but you had to be aware that people could not speak to you freely. So I was, for instance, at a, at a book festival um, in Poland, and I said, um, why are there so many beautifully illustrated children's books? And they said, think about it. <laughs> what was the answer? The answer was they weren't political. You could have these children's books without getting into trouble. And of those three countries, I would say East Germany was the, was the most closed. You couldn't really speak to anybody there. Czechoslovakia, you could speak to people, but not in a room. Not in a room, not in a car, because everyone assumed that they would be bugged. And that was true. Um, in Poland, it was much more open um, because they, they always had a strong opposition and the uh, regime couldn't kill everybody. <laughs> so like that. So, it, but, but still, I had to be careful um, who I talked to, where, and what I said about it afterwards. But you can get people into a lot of trouble. Um, you can go out, they are still there, they can't speak freely. And that's, that's just what it's like in those situations. I'm getting a lot of flickering here. Okay, so, uh, so should you go or should you not go? Those will be the conditions that you're going under. You're not going to a free and open discussion of, of cultural matters. And, um, and, and people should just realize that. How could you? How could you be? I think uh, we all, I, I'm, uh, I have experienced uh, uh, things uh, you have been talking about uh, as I was a child or uh, young, uh, because I have been living in the Ukraine uh, before uh, the Ukraine became independent. And uh, the situation now is a little bit different because um, back then uh, we had uh, a regime to fight against it and it was the same regime in Ukraine and in Russia, uh, mm -hmm. all these countries, but now we have an open war and yeah. uh, we think about the second uh, world war, it was not possible uh, to have a liter literary discussion between German writers and uh, Soviet writers. It was absolutely not possible because it was war. But now uh, people uh, think um, it is possible besides the war. And it is a thing that um, is embarrassing me because uh, we cannot do it. It is not about if somebody is speaking freely uh, or if somebody uh, cannot do it. It is about just uh, do this boycott in all the parts, and especially in the culture. It is painful, but uh, without it, uh, we cannot uh, stop this war. Uh, yes, it doesn't work. Uh, and also, if you do go to such an event, it, you will be used as propaganda um, to say, look, everything's fine. I suppose that's the other thing you must consider. Um, so we, we feel, um, it, it's painful for um, Russian artists who didn't uh, want this war and aren't 
in agreement with it, it's painful for them. Uh, there were uh, German writers who were also similarly against uh, the Hitler regime. Most of them were either um, killed or they went into exile uh, because that regime did not tolerate any dissent whatsoever. And the kind of noises we have heard coming out of Russia would indicate they're going in that direction as well. Um, so yes, it's, it's getting more extreme. I, I don't know who the people are that um, are organizing these events and thinking that things are, are okay. And uh, I suppose they're, they're optimistic, wishful thinkers who hope everything will be okay in the future. But um, this is not the future. Unfortunately, <laughs> let's talk about uh, more personal things. We were announced uh, to speak about a uh, feministic angle. What do you think about uh, women at war? Uh, Ukrainian is not exactly a country where we, uh, even before, where we can uh, talk about really um, gender sensitive society um, and uh, my fear is it uh, will get worse after the war uh, because we have this uh, strong uh, dividing now between women who are allowed to uh, uh, go out from, from the country to flee and men who have to fight uh, they want or not, and it will uh, separate the society even more. And uh, what will we see after the war? Uh, most strong, strongly women who are more self-confident because of the experience, or vice versa, more domestic abuse and more problems in the relationships. Are you optimistic or are you pessimistic <laughs> in those prognosis? War is always horrible for women. Actually, war is horrible for everybody. Uh, war is horrible for women in specific ways. And uh, we might add in children um, because war is also uh, very horrible for children if they were caught in it. They have no means of defense. Um, so you can see why this would happen. You don't get the women and children out Number one, get them out to protect them, but number two, get them out to get them out of the way um, so that we can do war. <laughs> uh, war. War is not fun for anybody and it damages people. Um, it damages everybody who is involved in it without a doubt. Um, what has happened in the past, um, looking at World War II, we, we, we know that people uh, come back from a war feeling that that others don't understand what they have been through. And that is probably correct. Others don't understand what they have been through. Um, similarly, it's very difficult to understand what it is like to be a woman with a family just wrenched out of your life and stuck in another country uh, away from everything that you have known. Uh, this is, these are very damaging um, experiences, and um, w with with without a doubt, there's there's going to be damage on both sides. Um, what can I tell you? You already know this. Yes, I know this, but um, I'm not expecting uh, the real help from you, but. Do we have an idea what we can do as writers, as women? Should we uh, do something? Should we organize some? Um, uh, well, I think you can act as citizens, which which doesn't it's not dependent on being a writer at all. Um, uh, or one can act as writers, and and one of the things that people did as as writers uh, in past wars was they recorded. So they recorded what was happening. They recorded what was happening to them. They recorded what was happening to people that they uh, could observe. Uh, and they, they told the story of reality. 
So that is one thing that people can do as writers. I think the, the big war novels, <laughs> the, the, the big what happened in the war novels tend to come after. Uh, because because who who can who can write this during the actual events that are unfolding? It's very hard to do that. I I know of a couple of instances, a couple of books that were written that way, but uh, but they too were recording books. But this is what happened this week, um, and some of them were smuggled out at the time. Uh, but the big sort of war and peace major novels appear later. I'm sure there are writers at this very moment. In fact, I know there are now that we have um, bloggers and now that we have instant transmissions. There are people writing from inside Ukraine right now. And as long as there is an internet connection, they're able to get their, their reporting um, outside of the country. Uh, there were a number of um, intrepid war reporters in World War II who were women actually went to front lines. They, they reported what they were seeing. Um, so I think, I think telling people the reality, you know, this is what is happening, um, there's, there's value to that. It means that, that, that other people cannot take a simply a, um, a rosy or um, romantic view of these kinds of events. What do you think? I think also, of, um, you know, poets who were who were writing at the time. But but every writer is 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 going to be asking, who is my audience? For whom am I writing? So are you writing for the future? Are you writing for the present? Are you writing for people in Ukraine? Are you writing for the, the world? Are you writing for all of those things? I think and there's both. a value simply to writing down, yes. And you define if, if you are right, when you are writing uh, all these parts, yeah, if I'm writing just for this audience, not for another. Uh, yeah. It would be difficult for me. Of course, and 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 you never know who your reader may be. We all know that the writing goes out; you don't know who's going to read it. But but some writers are quite specific about about who they believe they are writing uh, for, um, and others others it's for whoever may be my my reader. Yeah, and another topic uh, what uh, is bothering me are our feelings, our personal boundaries. Uh, and uh, it is really often that I hear, uh, okay, now is not the time to think about it. Now is not the time to be careful about it. It is a war and it is an excuse to hurt people, to say some crucial things, to do um, what is unacceptable for others just because of the war, just because of uh, your own uh, reasons, uh, you want to do it and you have this excuse. And I'm wondering uh, why, because uh, for me, uh, such difficult times like now, uh, is exactly a time where you can be especially careful about your feelings because if you hurt somebody's feelings, uh, you make people uh, weak, you uh, don't give them strength to fight, to be uh, useful. Uh, why people underestimate it? Uh, why is it? Why are those excuses? Uh, even and can you explain this a little bit? Do you mean that people are using the war as an excuse to to get back at individuals that they're angry with, like that? Yeah. For example, uh, I am speaking with somebody and I say some unpleasant things, uh, and 
people get hard, uh, but anybody says, okay, don't get hard, don't uh, react on this. Everybody has a right to speak freely because we have a war and it is, uh, it is not important how you feel. It is important what you do, <laughs> just go and fight. <laughs> When people are expressing their their own anger um, at other people, is, is that it? Yeah. I'm not quite understanding what's going on. Um, everybody's everybody's very tense. Everybody's on edge. People lose their tempers. Is that it? And attack one another. Is that what's happening? I'm not sure. Yeah, it's what's happening, but uh, uh, I am thinking all the time there are other people who are caring about feelings, who try to support each other, and it is much more powerful and much more um, or future oriented or result oriented. And I think um, we have to learn how to. Uh, how to work with feelings, not just explain ourselves, okay, now it's war, then it's after the war, and, and we have always reasons uh, to excuse our um, our behavior, but perhaps it is better not to look for excuses, but uh, just not do such things, just to be cooperative, especially at those times. Oh, so you're speaking about people who, um you want everything to be about them. So how I feel, my fear, my upset, etc. instead of let, let's all uh, join together and work for our common goal, like that. I think it is both possible. I would not divide it. Uh, you have, you can join together, you have, can work together, but you can still uh, be careful about not hurting each other, uh, I would not say uh, it is not important at such times. Uh, it is just an excuse. Uh, people get hurt all the time and uh, it, it is not working for them. It is working against them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I think we can't, we went through a sort of uh, several generations in which uh, there was a lot of talk about your inner feelings. So that's not my generation. We didn't do that. <laughs> but I, I can say that the younger people did. Um, maybe people who are now, what, in their 30s? Like that. A lot of self-care blogs. Um, going to the spa. I'm, I'm not sure. Big emphasis <laughs> on... on, uh, on individual people and their feelings. Um, so it's not somebody my age, that's not, it's not very familiar to us because we didn't grow up that way. And um, it's not, it's not something we would, we would do very much. People in their seventies and eighties, we were supposed to be quite tough about our feelings. <laughs> I was also not brought up that way. Uh, I grow, was grown up in so Soviet Union. The feelings were not important there, and uh, yeah. Uh, but I, uh, I try to uh, to rethink it and I try to analyze it, and uh, it is just rational. Uh, it gives me more power uh, to uh to work with uh, with good feelings not with bad feelings <laughs> okay so yes that's that's certainly the kind of thing my mother used to say <laughs> <laughs> so you see generations are not important <laughs> over a walk <laughs> it is people related <laughs> yeah, okay so yes um that seems to be a I don't know what's going on with with people and what they're saying to one another that's hurtful. Um, but we should certainly try not to do that. But we should try to not to do that even when it's not a war. Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. But then we don't have this nice excuse. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, it's, so, it's, so I'm only I'm only behaving this way because there's a war. Is that the excuse? <laughs> 
just kills everything. <laughs> All right, now that I know, I can, I can be more badly behaved, even worse than usual. But the thing about people who have the survival syndrome, uh, I experience it, of course, uh, all the time in uh, <clears throat> people who I, I know. And uh, some of them are suffering because they are abroad, not in the country. Other are suffering because they are in the country, but not uh, in the worst places. Another are suffering uh, because they're doing a lot, but they uh, cannot do all they need. <laughs> And everybody is suffering uh, from it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> well, it is a problem. <laughs> it's, always, it's always horrible. Um, so I've been reading quite recently about Martha Gellhorn, who is one of these war correspondents. And, and she reported a lot of battles. And she was, she was there. And she went to a lot of wars. And she said towards the end of her life, it was always worse than I could write. So it was always worse. And I, I think it is, it is so awful uh, to be in a war that, that people have tried to describe it in many different books and in many different reports and articles. And it's always worse. It's always worse than anything that you could, than you could say. Um, and that is why you know, it would be really great if people wouldn't do it. Um, but they do, and, and um, why do they do it? Well, usually they do it because they think they can. You know, they think they can win. Uh, it's, it's, they're always resource wars. Uh, it's always, you know, invasions are always about taking other people's stuff, to put it very uh, baldly. Um, they want your stuff. They want your land. They want your resources. They want your um your people they they want your things and, and they try to take them through wars because they think they can it's my very simple analysis of it um and it seems to me that in this case there was a miscalculation do you not yeah. agree there was a miscalculation um, Russia thought that Ukraine would just kind of fall over. That has not happened. And everybody is very admiring um, of the fact that it has not happened. So that ought to make people feel um, slightly more encouraged. And um, the rest of the world is following this very closely. So I would say this is the, the, the first really pivotal event of the 21st century. And it has um, changed opinions already. And, and one of the opinions that it has changed, people were being a little bit um, dismissive of the idea of liberal democracy before this time. They're thinking, no, it doesn't work. No. Um, and these autocrats were coming in because there were not enough people willing to defend the ideas of, of liberal democracy and freedom of expression as we began by discussing. But that has changed. It changed very quickly. Um, so it's no longer fashionable um, to say, well, democracy, who cares? That's not fashionable anymore. And that is because, um, because Ukraine fought back. Those ideas meant enough to people that they were willing to defend them. So for those of us, for, for, old, for those old schnookies like me who, who still believe, uh, okay, democracy isn't perfect, but it's better than the alternatives. Okay, for people like me, we feel quite cheered up. So thank you. Uh, thank you for this quite an unexpected perspective. We have a plenty of comments and questions in the chat. So I will probably refer a couple of. First of all, we have a question from Anastasia Vlasova. 
what would you recommend for people who are trapped inside the propaganda and autocratic regime? The victim of propaganda seems to be dragging down those who are opposed and it's getting harder and harder to start the ground, stand the ground. So which, which would be your recommendation, how you can fight back? Oh boy, it would be presumptuous of me to even have an opinion about that. Um, but I can, I can tell you and you know, if, if you were there behind the Iron Curtain, that there was an underground uh, network and it, it had to be underground because if it was above ground, those people would be put in prison or killed. Um, and this is what it, I found so hard to explain. <clears throat> when The Handmaid's Tale first came out as a book, people were saying to me, well, why didn't they this? Why didn't they protest? Why didn't they this? Why didn't they not? I said, because in those regimes, they take it, they're serious totalitarian regimes and they kill you if you do that. So how do you resist without being killed? That's the question. Um, the people who have overtly demonstrated in Russia so far have been very brave, um, but the regime is intending to, to squash them. And, um, and how will that work out? We, we don't know yet. Um, so, so these things are always a question of what What's the reality on the ground? You know, what can you do? What can you say without just being eliminated? And I noticed that there has just been an open letter by some um, intellectuals in, the, in, in Russia. That was brave. Um, but when you have a situation where the, where the state controls all of the uh, media outlets, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy, but you, you will start probably an underground media and you'll have to do that quite carefully because, because, because you will not be uh, viewed in a friendly manner by the regime. So if I would uh, be a victim of propaganda, uh, uh, so if I should answer this question, I would say today the world is uh, so big and the information is uh, that accessible that everybody can uh, stop being the victim for propaganda. Of course, you cannot stop the regime to, uh, to, to and you will have the consequences, but uh, you still have possibilities to inform yourself, to resist, uh, at least in your mind, at least in the speaking to other people, at least uh, building such uh, communities and thinking about the ways uh, it should start uh, and at some point, and because you cannot always be just victim of propaganda. It's, it's true, but you must be aware of the fact that, that of, of course, there will be infiltrators. Um, there will people. There will be people who pretend to be uh, resistant to the regime. You'll actually despise. Yeah. yeah. So we all um, know it, but as, at some point uh, you should start. <laughs> yeah, you can start, but you should be careful. Yeah, of course. Yeah, this is a very precarious position for sure. And uh, the, but the only answer, as I can see from both of you, is awareness, right? raising awareness and it really depends on how you can express it. And the next question from our viewers is basically about that. Lisa Shant asks from the editor's perspective, will Russian writers and artists writing against the Putin regime eventually get discouraged to raise their voices if they are under death threat in their country and not heard or ignored or even banned in the rest of the world? And if so, what are the consequences of, for the current and the next generations of writers or artists from Russia? What they can do, <clears throat> excuse me, and what should these writers uh, do in these times to support Ukraine? Being realistic, right? <laughs> Referring to the question we just discussed. Yeah, um, you, you can't tell people what to do. You uh, can, <laughs> but if so, they won't. <laughs> You can tell them they may not listen, uh, but you can tell them, and if they do it, it may be too dangerous. Um, so, so all I can say is that there will be such people. There always have been. Um, 250,000 Russians have gone into exile already. 
All right, so we're probably going to hear from them, uh, as we heard from, from exiles in the past. Um, but from within the regime, it's difficult. Um, Richard Kapuczynski, who is a Polish writer, uh, did quite a brilliant thing, which was that he, he wrote about the emperor of Ethiopia and a corrupt government uh, during the time of Polish communism. Everybody in Poland knew he was really writing about the, the regime in Poland, but because it said Ethiopia, the regime couldn't object. So I think we'll probably have some metaphorical works. This is exactly how our viewers respond. They are reminding Ahmed about the coach and special languages like being used in the past, metaphors that mask your meaning, some is that, use poetry which can be coded. And even myself as a post-Soviet kid, I remember how to read between the lines, yeah. right? There's going to be a lot of between the lines. Um, and um, and a lot of symbolic theater, shall we say, um, that is that is understood in one way by part of the audience and and understood in another way by an, another part of the audience. Um, you know, it's 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 very um, difficult and. Um, and a, a tightrope act for anybody doing it. So walking on a tightrope. But oh, yeah. it has been done and it, it can be done and it will be done. I can guarantee you that. It's, it's very hard to keep writers completely suppressed all the time. I think the tradition is already there. Uh, a lot of uh, examples of so Soviet time, uh, how uh, writers uh, did it against the regime, how they uh, succeed uh, in all these ways, writing against. And I think uh, it is everything uh, just uh, just to use it now. So it is nothing. Yeah, to just to refresh, I can say that. I, I, even my generation, our generation, still have those skills. We just need Already to refresh them. <laughs> yeah, we have another question, which is probably not say about literature, but about the perspective. If it is hard for writers to fully capture the horrors of war in words, what role does video play or photographs play in the war for the hearts and minds of the world? Is it true that picture is worth a thousand words or you don't agree with it? as a writer. Um, they are very powerful, but we have to know what their pictures are. <laughs> and we already know that, you know, some fake pictures have been appearing, there are pictures of something else, they're relabeled. Um, so the, the ability to check, you know, check against reality, um, that becomes hard to do during the war. <laughs> so you have to have a, um, you have to have some trust in the source where these pictures are coming from. And you have to believe that you're not being lied to about what the pictures contain. Um, and then we know, you know, we know the pictures can be very powerful, but they, but, but we have to believe that they're pictures of what they say they are pictures of. So fo following this on, um, following this through various sources in the Ukraine, uh, we get the picture and then we get the another fact checker saying, we think this is what it says it is. I think pictures, um, we can share our emotions with pictures, but words are to be analytical, to think uh, deeper and go under things uh, and uh, explain some things that is not obvious and not seen as a picture. So I would not say uh, they, uh, they could be compared which is other, uh, they have different functions and we should have a picture and a capture. <laughs> yeah, I should recall that we have a number of cases when the same picture is presented on both sides in very different way and only <laughs> words can create the, the context, right? Of course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and 
No, we have completely a uh, literature question, which is more powerful, writing for a specific audience, however narrow or wide, or writing to express yourself, if it's even a choice. <laughs> I think it is the best to do both, to express yourself and to get to the right audience. <laughs> Okay, so we don't know what yourself is anyway, uh, but let us say that the, the writing is, is an act of evocation and, uh, and it evokes uh, feelings in the reader. Uh, and by the time it is evoking feelings in the reader, the feelings of the writer don't matter. Um, so we can, we can read um, books by dead people the feelings of the dead people are unknown to us. They're dead. They're not going to tell us about their feelings anymore. But the book tells us. Um, but the book is, is, is telling us about our feelings when we read it. So once, you, once the book is out there in the world, it doesn't belong to the writer anymore. It belongs to the reader. So you're writing for the reader, whoever that may be. Um, of course, you're using part of yourself. You can't do otherwise. It all goes through your head. Um, but, but once it's out there in the world, it's not about you anymore. It's about the reader. How about that? I think that's pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for your answers. We have a lot of questions, but the last one for today is about how the war changed the social roles of women and men, and what can we do about that? Uh, Fadi asks us, what will be the role of women writers in diaspora after leaving Ukraine? And how these women will be able to transfer the image of war uh, away from the country? Oh boy. <laughs> yeah, we have, I'm especially <laughs> only going for very complicated questions. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I think uh, it is, uh, not especially uh, important if you are in the country or if you are out of the country. It uh, depends on the person. There are a lot of, pers uh, of people who are living uh, at war, uh, but they cannot express it. They cannot explain it. They uh, are not asked. Uh, they cannot formulate. And I think uh, there are uh, work to explain things, uh, to talk about things, to analyze things, to describe things, depends not uh, from women or men. It, uh, it is uh, the work uh, for intellectuals who are doing it all the time at war or uh, at another time. We are just rethinking uh, the time, we are thinking about uh, something that happens uh, but is not realized and should be um, put into words, put into uh, some constructions and discussed. And uh, it is not the matter on the presence at some special uh, place or some special time. Uh, it, it is uh, analyzing all this from, uh, from your point where you are now, from your ability to, to do it from, from your possibilities. Yeah. I guess the question was also about the very objective situation when women, especially with the young kids, are became a face of Ukrainian diaspora just from the very objective reasons, right? Because men mostly fighting and can't leave the country physically, right? So do you think that we will have uh, any long-term consequences on it? And how should we address this, if you can respond? I think we already have the consequences of it, and it will be worse uh, because war is never good for relationships, for children, for women. It is bad for all, and uh, relationships will be damaged as well uh, as well as uh, all the country will be. So we just uh, will have to find uh, the ways how to how to live after the war. It would be not easy. It's going How would to be you hard. command Margaret? Yes, please. It will be hard. Um, it will be hard, but it will be possible. I hope so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it will be possible. That's a um, great, very optimistic statement. 
We will just write it down. Margaret Edwards said us, it will be possible. We should do it. <laughs> I didn't say it wouldn't be hard. <laughs> you are responsible for it now. <laughs> Um, but this is this basically to, seems to be Ukrainian style nowadays. Let's do impossible, right? Thank you. Thank you, Margaret, for your very pan inspired approach and deep writer's background. If you have any conclusion or any closing note, please. Well, we're all very, we're all very, um, we're absolutely riveted um, by this event. I follow it every day. And, um, it is, it is just astonishing uh, what Ukraine has managed to do. It is, it is really exceptional. And, and that is what you find all of the um, war commentators, you know, the war historians, the logistics people, uh, all of those people are saying, uh, this has been amazing. So we used to have an expression in our country Give us the tools and we will finish the job. So I would say to the rest of the world, give Ukraine the tools and it will finish the job. Yes, please listen to the words. Give us the tools and we'll do the job. Thank you, Natalka, for your personal experience and bringing up those difficult, controversial issues. Do you have any closing remarks? I will not spoil it. it cannot be better <laughs> what did you say so thank you true. So <laughs> true. Uh, what can we can take from this conversation is definitely deeper understanding and some answers about what can i do to help ukraine as a writer as intellectual today i would say be aware first of all understand and give the tools they will manage the job <laughs> We are grateful to our partners for today's event. First of all, Pan Canada, who made this possible. Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, and the Harman Institute at Columbia University. And for the cross streaming service on all the partners pages. Gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine, which continues to stay at the front lines in the name of freedom and truth. Pan International is proud to be a platform that supports freedom of expression. Pan International Charter highlights the need to ensure that works of art, the patrimony and humanity at large, should be left untouched by national and political passion. Upholding and recalling our charter is this time remain crucial. This is what is happening in Ukraine right now. Please follow our page to be informed about further events over the next week. One of the next episodes I can announce for now will be broadcast on Wednesday, 25th of March, at 4 p.m. Kyiv time, 2 p.m. London time. Alexander Mehad, writer, curator of art projects and literary scholar, will speak with Vital Shabovsky, an award fed Benin Polish journalist and reporter. Thank you again, our great speakers. Thank you, our viewers. Follow our dialogues on war, share the stream, spread the word, and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Whew, okay, done.